It's a lovely day in August 2012. It's a great day to be here with my Hawaiian shirt and several friends. I'd like to point out one of the monuments of Geneva. Over there across the bridge is a Neo-Gothic thing, which is actually a mausoleum. Uh, and it's the remains of the Duke of Brunswick, an English Duke who loved Geneva and wanted to be buried at Lakeside. And of course he was refused, but then when he heard that the city fathers were trying to raise the money for the new Natural History Museum, he said, I'll give the money for the museum. And it's a huge building that you can visit today, taking up a full city block of several stories high. And he gave the money for it, and he was given the right to have his tomb there perpetually. Um, so it's actually a monument to death and money. And these are two of the spirits of this city. I think they made a, a real mistake that they didn't give him a 99-year lease or something, but it, it's in per perpetuity, so they just spent millions to renovate this thing, which is all about death and money. Um, the other key place, especially this year in 2012, is Rousseau's Island, which you saw um, as we began to. Rousseau actually had nothing to do with it. That was a fortification, part of the city fortifications. It was put there in order that cannons could defend against uh, warships coming up the river. But they put, they had to put the statue of Rousseau somewhere, so they put it here on the island. A couple interesting things about that, and that is that um, this year is Rousseau's 300th birthday. He was born in 1712 in Geneva. So they had the statue of him, it was facing out, but as a sign of honoring Rousseau in his 300th anniversary, this year they turned the statue around and it's facing the city. This is because he was exiled from the city. <laughs> uh, because his writings were so outrageous, they exiled him, banned him from ever coming back to Geneva. But for his 300th birthday, everything is fine. We've had reconciliation. The other thing about that island that is interesting spiritually, talking about the strongholds over the city, our very first school of intercession in YWAM was run in Lausanne by Paul Hawkins. And one of the speakers was Linda Cowie, our, one of our key intercessors in, in uh, YWAM, who, who was taught all over the world. And this was a whole group of, of intercessors, and they were together um, right out near the island. I don't remember if it was on the bridge or on the island itself, but Linda turned and started praying against the spirit over the financial sector of, of Geneva. And then she started choking. Invisible hands were choking her. And when the others realized what was happening, they immediately turned to her and started praying for these hands to be, to be loosed, and she was okay. But it just was a sign. Back then there was very little intercession for Geneva and they were one of the pioneer teams and uh, it was a counter-attack. It's the kind of thing that we have to be very careful of. Let me mention another symbol of the city, or the state I should say, because Geneva is not just a city but a canton. We can't see it from here, but over in those trees is the English gardens. There was another Englishman who loved Geneva and paid for the city to build this park out into the lake an ambassador, English ambassador to Switzerland. So that's why it's called the English Gardens. It's the best place to buy drugs, which I'm not recommending, but I mean, if you want to witness to those people, that's where you go and hang out. And in our summer of service in 1980, we had permission to preach the gospel there every night. Um, but just behind the trees there is a statue of two women, very muscular, with swords and shields, and one of them is embracing the other, and it's Helvetia, Switzerland, embracing Geneva as Geneva joins Switzerland, which only happened in the early 19th century. Um, Geneva was not part of Switzerland until that time, and actually many Genevans still think they're not part of Switzerland, but they technically are. <laughs> but back in the early 19th and 18th centuries, the spirits of each city 
were personified by warrior women. And you can go to any city museum in Europe and you'll see paintings or sculptures of what they, what they uh, imagined the spirit of the city looked like. And it, it was always a, a feminine being. There's been a centuries-old argument between Lausanne and Geneva, for example. The Genevans see Lausanne as the, as the farm lady, and Lausanne sees Geneva as the prostitute. So that's still going on today. Uh, it's not over. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> it's interesting that the, the feminine spirits of the city are still with us, even though we don't think that way so much in the West anymore. The town of Morges between Geneva and Lausanne is, has always been called Morges la Jolie. Mm. Morges the pretty, the pretty lady, the pretty girl. So the we need to, as we move into a city and pray for it, we need to discern what the spirit of the city and be able to call out the redemptive aspects that God created her to be, but also to resist the, the evil and the traps and temptations that she's fallen into. Um, let me just mention a bit about the situation. We're here by the, next to the Rhone River, which rises in the Alps, flows through the lake and all the way down to the Mediterranean. The Rhine River also rises in the Alps and flows north to the North Sea. So because of the, these rivers, the Celts, centuries before the Romans got here, the Celts were able to transport their merchandise from the North Sea to the Mediterranean all by water, except for just a few kilometers in the canton of Vaud. So this was a very important waterway, and around this lake you have the mountain passes. The mountain passes to Italy over there, um, to France, up behind Bertigny the pass to Paris, of course the Rhone River to the Mediterranean, and the mountain passes to Germany up uh, on the other side of Lausanne. So if you wanted to move merchandise or armies around Europe, you have to come along here. And that's still the case. We're in a perpetual argument with the European Union over how many 40-ton trucks they can send through our roads and mountain passes. Napoleon hated the Alps because they slowed down his armies so much. He actually said he wanted to flatten them. So we're so glad he did not win those wars. But Geneva has always been this crossroads city. And one of the reasons it remained independent was because it was in everyone's interest that Geneva remained independent. So the major powers could have taken Geneva over at any time in any century, but they, they didn't because they were afraid of the next major power. So some people say this road around the, this side of the lake is the oldest road in the world. Uh, I don't think it is. I think there are probably Middle Eastern and Central Asian roads which are older. But this is one of the oldest continuously inhabited spots on Earth. They've found um, human remains, the archaeologists have found, going back even in the time of the glacier. There was a 1,000 meter high glacier here. 10,000 years ago, but they have found on the Salev, the mountain outside Geneva, they found human, human evidence of human occupation even when the glacier was here. So they lived up above the 1,000 meters where there was forest, and they would walk across that glacier to the next bit of forest for their hunting. So there have been people living here for many, many thousands of years continuous, continuously. This is a great place to live. It's the sunniest spot in Switzerland, north of the Alps, in terms of sun days per year. The climate is very temperate. The lake level is the lowest part of Switzerland at 372 meters. So it is a, it's a great place to live. And since the 19th century, with the International uh, Red Cross beginning here, it's also been the meeting place of the world. It's a very small city, only 400,000 population. And another 400,000 come into Geneva every day to work from France and the canton of Vaud. So in the daytime, Geneva is mostly English speaking. But still, even at the top, it's uh, well under a million in population. But with the European headquarters of the United Nations here, 70% of the work of the United Nations is done in Geneva. It's not done in New York, it's done in Geneva. Because along with that headquarters, the European headquarters, there is the international headquarters of some of the other organizations 
that are part of the United Nations, such as the International Labor Federation, the World Health Organization, the United Nations High Commission of Refugees, then you have the International Red Cross, major N NGOs, also the World Trade Organization, which I think is the most powerful organization in the world. It's the one where when China wanted to join, they gave them a book full of laws that needed to change. Now Russia is in that process and they're going to give them a book full of laws that need to change. These are the people who can tell nations to change their laws. There are not many organizations that can do that. So, <clears throat> the point is this. More decisions are made that affect more people and more nations in the world, Geneva, than any other city. This is a crucial city for the world, not just because of its heritage, not just because of the desire for a new reformation, but because of what happens here every day affects the world. So this is why we need prayer for the city. This is why I keep leading tours around the city because I have seen by the grace of God intercessors raised up and ministries begun because people catch the vision for Jehovah.